Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Urban Institute. I'm Mary Cunningham. I'm the Vice President of Metropolitan Housing and Communities here at Urban. I'm so excited to welcome you all here to this virtual space. Today, we will hear from two panels, one focused on eviction prevention and the other on what we're learning about landlord behavior during the pandemic. These panels will discuss research completed during the last year by the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative. The collaborative was launched in April 2020 to solicit and respond to the most pressing questions policymakers and practitioners have faced throughout the pandemic. The collaborative is comprised of researchers from the Urban Institute, Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, and the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to these core research partners, we've identified and invited researchers from other institutions and organizations to the table by providing grants to pursue their research. The collaborative also includes seven network partners from practice and policy. And I'm gonna read the list because they play an important role. They're the Council of Large Public Housing Authorities, the Housing Partnership Network, National Association of Counties, National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, National Council of State Housing Agencies, National Council, National League of Cities, and the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And like I said, I read the list because they play an important role in the collaborative. These organizations work with the core research partners to identify pressing research questions needed to address the country's rental crisis at this time. This collaboration is a great example of researchers connecting and informing the urgent needs of practitioners and policymakers. I wanna give a shout out to my colleague Solomon Green for having the vision to bring us all together. Thanks Solomon. We've published 10 briefs in, since October, 2020, and we have another 11 in the pipeline that will be published in early 2022. If you'd like to read more about the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative, please visit housingcrisisresearch.org. Housing so before I introduce our first speaker um, and we get deep into the discussion, I'm gonna quickly review some housekeeping. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterward. Um, you can hide your captions or adjust settings with a live transcript button. Speaker biographies are posted online at urban.org. All participants will be muted, but you can type your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time. And lastly, please complete the survey at the end of the event. So that's it for housekeeping. I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, Erica Pothig. Erica is Special Assistant to the President for Housing and Urban Policy in the White House Domestic Policy Council. In this capacity, she leads the interagency policy development on housing and community development components of the President's Build Back Agenda. Erica is a former colleague and someone I miss seeing every day on Zoom, something I never thought I would say, miss seeing people on Zoom but I'm happy to have her here. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, she served as vice president and chief innovation officer at the Urban Institute, where she created and led the Research to Action Lab, an innovative hub serving decision makers and creative thinkers eager to affect social change. Before Urban, Erica held positions at HUD, the MacArthur Foundation, and the city of Chicago. We invited Erica to speak today about the importance of research at this time. Welcome, Erica. Mary, it is such a delight to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of um, this event and to mark the first year of the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative. And I also tip my hat, of course, to Solomon Green, uh, Madeline Brown, and so many of the others at Urban who have made this possible alongside the critical uh, partners, uh, research partners in the effort. So thank you. Um, so let me start by saying the word unprecedented gets thrown around quite a lot, but I think it's fair to say that we are truly living in unprecedented times in, within the housing field, um, both in the magnitude of the crisis, but also the magnitude of the resources available to manage the crisis and hopefully build back better. But what's also unprecedented is the amount of thoughtful research 
like yours uh, and the teams uh, uh, from Furman, Turner, and the Joint Center for Housing Studies and those other researchers who are supported through the effort. That's really been fundamental to our understanding of the problems and also identifying um, and improving upon the solution sets. And that's what I wanna talk about today. And let me just make something really clear. <laughs> Evidence really matters. Um, facts really matter. And we wouldn't be making as much progress, and I do want to say, I think we are making progress uh, without the evidence, without the insights that um, the folks who are going to speak today uh, and who have been a part of the contributions to this effort have made. Um, so evidence and facts matter. Let me make that clear. Evictions have been notoriously um, tough to track, especially in real time. In a given pre-pandemic year, the eviction lab estimates that there are 3.6 million eviction filings that result in 1.5 million eviction judgments annually. However, we know that this is likely an undercount uh, because there are more total unforced moves or moves that happen before an eviction is filed that don't get counted in that count. Um, we know through the American Housing Survey, which is a survey sponsored by the Office of Policy Development and Research at HUD in collaboration with the US Census, that roughly 6% of renter households or nearly 3 million renter households were behind on rent at any given time uh, before the pandemic. Now data from the Census Household Pulse Survey suggests that the number of households behind on rent has approximately doubled to over 6 million um, households during the pandemic, while also suggesting that there are between two to three million households we believe that are at risk of, or they believe that they're at risk of eviction in the next few months. So that's a little bit about how many people uh, think they're at risk of eviction. We also have a number of different estimates uh, for um, how much back rent is owed, which is what's putting renters at risk of eviction um, for that uh, non-payment of rent. Uh, Moody's, Goldman Sachs, PolicyLink, the F Philadelphia Federal Reserve, uh, Jim Parrott and Mark Sandy published a piece with, uh, on the Urban Institute platform that generally show that renter households owe approximately about $15 billion in back rent. Now, research from this collaborative, and particularly from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard, has been critical in documenting how renters and landlords are responding to financial stress during the pandemic. But research has also been critical to track the effectiveness of the actions and the tools that the Biden-Harris administration, as well as state and local governments, have adopted to deal with the rise in housing insecurity. And let me just again say that this evidence has really mattered and shaped uh, how those tools are coming together. So thank you. Um, for nearly a year, the CDC's eviction moratorium stood as a backstop to prevent renters from being evicted. The eviction lab estimates that the moratorium helped prevent 1.5 million eviction filings nationwide. What it also did was buy time for the 437 state and local governments administering the $46.5 billion in emergency rental assistance to launch and refine their programs. But I think we can all know, and the, and the articles have definitely, uh, in the papers have tracked this, state and local governments were initially slow to disperse the money due to a mixture of capacity issues and cumbersome requirements that state and local grantees imposed on landlords and tenants. Um, researchers from this collaborative, including Ingrid Goldellen, Vincent Riena, and the National Low Income Housing Coalition have been critical in documenting both the challenges and the best practices um, that have been created by the grantees of the emergency uh, rental assistance program. Several, several of the best practices that they noted in various reports have been adopted and encouraged via continued guidance from Treasury. And I just want to underscore for folks context, we are in constant communication, we are constant consumers of research, but also for feedback um, from all corners, grantees, tenant advocates, landlords, uh, in a move to improve upon uh, the guidance and, and ensure that the, uh, it can be dispersed uh, more easily. And after many months of collaboration between Treasury, the White House, and state and local governments uh, to increase the distribution of assistance to renters and landlords in need, 
thankfully, we are seeing improvements uh, in the disbursement of these funds. As of the end of August, state and local ERA programs have distributed more than 1.4 million payments to households, totaling more than $7.7 .7 billion to support the housing stability of vulnerable renters. Data also indicate that 60% of households served have extremely low incomes, meaning that these dollars are reaching precisely the families at greater, greatest risk of eviction. And research also shows that eviction filings are lower in jurisdictions that have distributed rental assistance faster. By the end of the year and assuming each month has the same level of expenditures as August, we believe we will serve approximately 3 million households and disperse approximately $16 billion in assistance. And we believe that every rental assistance payment made is an eviction prevented or forestalled. The availability of these resources has enabled cities and states to stand up eviction diversion programs. These and other partnerships with court systems and legal service organizations are critical tools for preventing housing insecurity and helping landlords recover from rental arrearages. This research collaborative and the Urban Institute in particular were critical in publishing early lessons from eviction diversion courts. The White House pointed to that research when we hosted multiple eviction prevention summits over the summer and encouraged delegations from jurisdictions with high risks of eviction spikes to adopt or expand eviction diversion programs. And I wanna thank the numerous people on this call who expertly facilitated those breakout sessions in the first summit and have been continuing to bear fruit today. We're seeing it, it's making a difference. All of these efforts have combined to mitigate what could have been a huge spike in evictions with disastrous implications for affected households. Based on available data from the Eviction Lab and Legal Services Corporation, which track eviction filings in jurisdictions that together account for roughly one in three renter households, eviction filings have remained at approximately half of historical averages in the month following the Supreme Court's decision on the CDC eviction moratorium. And let me be clear, notwithstanding this very um, positive trend, um, there is still much more work to do to prevent evictions, but we have not to this point seen the wave of evictions that so many of us feared after the Supreme Court struck down the moratorium. While we're still figuring out at why uh, and could use your help discerning, what's contributing to the decrease in uh, eviction filings, it's clear that rental assistance and the adoption of tenant protections and court supports are making a meaningful difference to households right now. Um, but we in the Biden administration are really focused on building something that lasts. As COVID-19 eventually transitions from a pandemic to an endemic disease, so too will the emergency rental assistance program. Research on the effectiveness of rental assistance will be critical as we make the case for continued rental assistance funds to address renters' financial hardships. So I wanna thank you once again for the work that you're doing. Um, oh, the door is always open to additional uh, insights uh, from your research that can inform the policies of the Biden-Harris administration. We wanna be a partner to your work going forward. Thank you so much. I believe I now have the distinct pleasure to turn over the Zoom room, the Zoom space to Reed Jordan, uh, who I have the, oh, had the pleasure uh, at one point of co-authoring uh, an analysis with on preservation as a strategy for both housing security and economic mobility. Reed, so good to see you. Uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Erica. It has been really wonderful to see how the research community through the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative has come together to provide quick turnaround analysis to help guide practitioners working on the ground at the local and state level, and policymakers working to keep people housed. And it's whether it's the emergency rental assistance programs, um, housing counseling, legal aid, eviction diversion, our entire housing ecosystem to support the lowest income renters has really transformed, um, pivoted overnight. And I think we all agree that it, it's critical to have research 
um, to understand these changes, to understand what works, and to understand where more support is needed. So I'm really excited today to facilitate a conversation um, among a group of researchers that have been studying various aspects of the, the emergency response. So in a moment, I will introduce uh, the panelists. And there are two sort of key themes that we hope to cover today. The first is what are the key lessons you know, that we have learned that can help ongoing implementation efforts to support renters during this crisis? So where do we stand right now on the eviction crisis and what has worked to keep renters stably housed? The second is that we also want to be learning from the crisis and thinking about longer term systems change. So what changes and innovations have been made during this period that should be locked in now, that really should be locked in moving forward. So I'm very excited about these panelists. Uh, we are joined by Lisa Bates, who is an associate professor at the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. Welcome, Lisa. We are also joined by Mark Treskin, who is a senior research associate at the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute. And Emma Foley, who is a research analysis analyst, excuse me, at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. So what we're going to do, we'll have an opening round of questions that really hit on the core research topics and policy areas that each um, of the panelists have been working on. Um, but we also really encourage attendees to drop questions in the chat for later um, to really um, get at the, the collective expertise of, of these panelists. So just to, to start us off, um, uh, I think we'll start with Mark. So Mark, at the, the national level, uh, you looked at a variety of different eviction diversion programs. So can you just tell us you know, what were the questions you were trying to answer and what were the, the really the critical main findings? Sure. Um, thanks, Reed, and thanks for everyone on this call for organizing and attending. Um, so our work, um, which we put out a brief in April, um, the core goal is really to identify eviction and prevention and diversion programs that were either started or modified during the COVID-19 pandemic and to better understand what their features were, basically what they were doing and what they were like. Overall, we examined 47 programs and interviewed four of them to get this details on distinct models to get a better sense of how things were working and how things were going and what they consisted of. So the most common feature we found in our scan were basically alternative dispute resolutions, things like mediation and rental assistance, um, followed by legal assistance. Now we found fewer programs incorporating things like housing or financial counseling, but they were out there too. I wanna stress that we weren't assessing the effectiveness or outcomes of these programs, but overall we did find that programs really showing promise and really talking about having some successful practices and outcomes from their own perspective tended to be multifaceted, both organizationally and what they did, um, and address renter needs holistically. Um, also ones that built equity into their design and outreach strategies, I think we're seeing a lot more success. They also tended to work with landlords and provide rental assistance. I think looking ahead, uh, as we publish that, I think a couple of the other dynamics we thought would be really important would be both the flexibility and responding to changing circumstances and new challenges. Again, our scan, our scan came out in April, um, but that already seems in some ways 100 years ago. And the other thing is also really wanting to pay attention to the opportunity that the to leverage pandemic response to implement sustainable and basically sustainable interventions. So that's where we ended up this past spring. Yes, and we heard from, from Erica about how helpful that research was really informing um, policy response over the summer. Um, so Lisa, um, switching over to you, you know, what has your research shown about the work happening in Oregon? You have had a much more sort of hyper-local, um, in-depth research looking at Oregon's eviction prevention program. Um, so what can you tell us about what's working, maybe what some of the challenges are? Yeah, so um, here in Oregon, we have um, what maybe was the intention, I think, was to kind of have a number of slices of Swiss cheese, knowing that no one system could could kind of catch everyone, but hoping that the holes are not aligned so that most people would be captured. Um, I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that combination of things, the holes are a lot bigger than anticipated. Um, and there's a lot of uh, folks that are kind of 
in a state of limbo. They might not have fallen all the way yet, but it's a combination of um, rather than an extended eviction moratorium, the state legislature created a set over period so that if a tenant does have a non-payment um, eviction filed against them and they have applied to rent assistance um, through the, the federal funding program, um, they can get a 60 day set over of their case. Um, of course, that requires the tenant to be aware that that protection exists to show up in court and request that set over and be granted the set over. Um, and those are some of those places where, you know, those kind of holes um, fall, fall through their cracks. Um, we are seeing in the, this early kind of summer and into the fall um, that about 25% of tenants with eviction cases filed against them are defaulting due to failure to appear at the first appearance in court. Um, so um, there are some gaps there, um, despite, recently ramping up a significant eviction eviction defense program that intends to provide all low income tenants with attorneys statewide. Um, there are just all the challenges of kind of outreach connecting with people finding them and plugging them into those legal resources that are very similar to the problems of plugging them into the rental assistance um, application and payment system, which um, I'll just conclude by saying is also Despite, yes, um, as Erica said, some improvements, Oregon's rental assistance program payments are very far behind. Um, and in fact, about one third of the completed applications to that system have yet to be opened and processed at all. Um, so folks are in a timeline crunch of a two month set over of an eviction case, an unknown timeline for receiving rental assistance. And that's kind of in the best case scenario in which they've also managed to uh, find and connect with an attorney in time for their case to go forward. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Um, and just turning to Emma, who's done some really national scans on emergency rental assistance programs um, as a really, I think, great bird's eye view of what's been happening. So Emma, curious from a practitioner standpoint, really what has stood out to you um, in relation to what you're seeing on the ground around various innovations in these programs, um, what's taken to, to get programs up and running, to get money out the door, um, really kind of what you're seeing around innovations and, and best practices. Thanks, Reed. So NLIHC, along with our partners, have been working to conduct research uh, to inform real-time advocacy and policy making, which has included the tracking and monitoring of emergency rental assistance programs and their progress, as well as more detailed research briefs around key features of ERA programs and innovative uh, case studies of innovative program design. And through this research, we've identified variations and innovations in many programs that significantly mitigate the risk of evictions. Several emergency rental assistance programs, for example, have developed agreements to sit in on housing courts to delay eviction proceedings and connect tenants with emergency rental assistance funding. So in Louisville, for example, emergency rental assistance program administrators have formed a strong partnership with local judges and courts, and a staff member attends eviction hearings to identify eligible tenants. And if a tenant agrees to participate, the judge can then delay the case, giving the tenant time to work uh, work with the program and apply for assistance. Programs can also implement really critical flexibilities within their emergency rental assistance programs to both help renters move through the application process more quickly and to ensure that no renter falls through the cracks. And these features can work in tandem with eviction diversion programs to, again, speed application processing and ensure housing stability. So a few examples of these are things like direct to tenant assistance, which is really critical to make sure that renters with landlords who refuse to participate in emergency rental assistance uh, or mediation can still receive that financial assistance. Research conducted by the coalition in partnership with the housing initiative at Penn and NYU Furman Center found that in 2020, nearly 50% of programs surveyed reported that landlord participation was a barrier and directed tenant assistance can really help mitigate this. Other things include income eligibility flexibilities like fact specific proxy and self attestation. 
These have allowed administrators to decrease the number of incomplete ERA applications and speed up processing. Connecticut is a good example of a place that's implemented this quickly by linking their application to a data set with qualified census tracts. And if an applicant inputs an address within one of those tracts, they're not asked to submit income documentation beyond the self-attestation. The city of Tulsa also uses this to fast track applications when an applicant is at imminent risk of eviction. And then finally, things like relocation assistance can uh, serve as a longer term solution to ensure housing stability for tenants whose landlords uh, might be hostile or threaten eviction in the future. And the most robust relocation assistance covers things like arrears of the previous unit, provides case management, support to find a new unit, and covers moving costs, security deposits, and future rent. We've seen this done in places like Denver and Boston. And so I'll just conclude in saying that, you know, these flexibilities and innovations within emergency rental assistance programs can really work together with eviction diversion efforts uh, to get people the assistance they need faster and prevent eviction proceedings. Thanks again, and I'll turn it back to you, Reed. Thank you, Emma. I think I want to stay on this sort of topic and theme of innovation for a moment. Um, I think one of the most striking features of the crisis is just how quickly local and state governments have had to evolve and shift strategies and make decisions in real time with incomplete information and data and an ever-changing landscape of unknowns. So um, Mark, I'm, I'm curious in the eviction diversion work, the, the research you've seen, were there any particular innovations around data, partnerships, outreach um, that you thought was uh, most impactful, most striking? Um, things that you're seeing on, on the ground through these uh, programs that you think um, really are the most kind of innovative features that we should be considering in, in the long term? Sure. Um, I think because it's such a multifaceted issue, I think, you know, some programs really were doing things that were, I think, really innovative in some, some areas, um, but they're also working within local context. And I think that's the other thing that's really important. And I think colors what you're able to do. What you're able to do and implement really varies on the state um, and, you know, jurisdiction level. And I think really does um, color basically what people are actually focused on doing in a particular area. I feel that areas that were able to do some really innovative work had some really good ways to break down silos between organizations that were doing complementary things, but ones that weren't necessarily allied or working together. I mean, I think Philadelphia's program where they actually got the city involved and working with a number of agencies to really implement something where there was not just sharing of information, but also more formal data sharing to understand what was actually happening to people as they went through the system was really, I think, innovative. Um, I think the work that we did, we also interviewed some people in Pinellas in County in Florida, where they were really doing some really good on the ground outreach stuff. And I think working with community organizations to really be on the ground to reach out people who, as I think we all know on this call, like aren't necessarily aware of some of these programs. Um, but might be most, you know, at risk of eviction. So I think they were doing a really good job reaching out to people who otherwise might not be familiar with these kinds of programs. So I think those are two that stick out to start. And on that piece of outreach, I, I do want to bring it back to the point that you know, Lisa was bringing up um, with their experience in Oregon about some of the gaps and challenges with outreach. And I think we've seen from some of the data that, that you just mentioned, Mark, that the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative has worked on and, and other data sources just showing how many renters and landlords aren't aware of the resources that, that are available to them. Um, so Lisa, based upon what you've you know, seen in Oregon, curious what you think is really needed to ramp up outreach to make sure people who really are at the margins or the most marginalized are aware of the resources to, to support them um, through the crisis. Um, yeah, well, certainly there's just a huge knowledge gap first for the many, many people who have never engaged with housing assistance before. I mean, everyone who is in the housing world knows that the vast majority of income eligible, eligible households don't have housing supports, they don't have subsidies, they've never engaged with the entities or systems um, that provide those subsidies. And now we're in a situation where, you know, in, you know, certainly in Oregon, so tens of thousands of households are newly eligible, income eligible for those kinds of programs. So there's one huge barrier, which is simply for folks to understand where to go um, and how to engage with 
a very unfamiliar set of um, set of organizations. Um, I was took part in a National Academy of Sciences um, panel on eviction prevention in which we really explored the use of more some of the more familiar systems as a possible way to provide information. So be those SNAP benefits, um, Social Security, um, uh, you know, our um, Amer healthcare systems that people engage with more routinely in order for them to know um, about the assistance that's available. And then to ensure that we're working with um, something that's happening in Oregon, funding directly to organizations that serve our um, communities of color, our um, language specific immigrant and refugee communities um, to try to create outreach um, that will support them very specifically. We still do struggle, I think, in the capacity of these online application systems. However, for folks who are um, traditionally marginalized and excluded to access the literal application system and sort of make it through um, those online systems, even when they're available in multiple languages, really very challenging. And I think I that's a good sort of transition to bringing Emma back in the conversation here. It sounds, Lisa, like there's like a technology challenge. There's a challenge with having the right partners who really understand community, um, who have legitimacy in community, obviously, uh, you know, language, um, cultural relevancy. So Emma, curious and kind of the scans that you've done, any sort of best practices that you've seen there around outreach, around engagement, really making sure that um, people who are most marginalized are aware of the programs and supported all the way through the, the application process. Yeah, definitely. I think Lisa touched on so many of uh, so many great points regarding effective outreach. And I think, you know, programs that have been really successful, like Lisa suggested, have partnered with organizations or social services that um, are already deeply rooted in the community. So in Richland County, South Carolina, for example, they partnered with the library system, uh, which and a social uh, worker within the library helps applicants every way through the application process. Um, and staff at libraries across the whole system know about the program and are telling people who come in. Uh, we've also done research with Santa Clara, who had a really robust uh, partner network in their 2020 program, uh, again, to reach people uh, where they're at and at organizations or services that they're already accessing. And I think, too, just to echo Lisa's point around assistance throughout that application process, you know, a, it's really critical to have a variety of ways for people to apply. So online is what most programs, uh, where most programs receive most of their applications, but paper applications with drop boxes or uh, applications that can be completed over the phone with someone who's very experienced with the program, again, in multiple languages uh, are is really critical. So we've definitely seen, um, you know, programs that have those robust partnerships and are offering applications in kind of a multitude of ways are also the ones that are really effective at distributing the funds. And I think that's a really interesting sort of lesson for long-term structural system change of what does it look like to have um, systems that are very inviting, encouraging, and easy to use. Um, so I think we're learning a lot through this experience of, of what are some of these longer term structural ecosystem changes to housing policy that we really should be thinking about and, and locking in now. So I'd love to do this a round robin on, on this topic of things that are on the top of your minds. Um, I know we're still <laughs> deep in this crisis and I, and I don't want to um, uh, take that for, for granted at all, but I also think this is a great opportunity to, to think about the, the horizon. So maybe Lisa, just starting with you, then we go Mark and Emma. Um, what are the things top of your mind in terms of these sort of longer term structural fixes that we should be trying to lock in? Um, well, what has been <laughs> troubling me throughout this, this whole crisis, but certainly speaks to um, long term and persistent problems is the extent to which we place the onus on tenants 
um, to know about, activate, and proceed and navigate through systems um, with which they are not familiar, which, with which they are not professionally engaged and without the assistance, um, in most cases, of attorneys. Um, whether that is, you know, the, the level of scrutiny that tenants are facing in many states in the ERA program, um, or it's, you know, simply knowing what to do when you get an eviction notice. Um, we are lacking visibility into much of the eviction process. In the West Coast, we don't know how many people get evicted because the first notice that a tenant gets, which launches their, their journey into this legal system, is not recorded anywhere. We don't see it. Um, and so in that moment, as a tenant, facing fear, uncertainty, um, you know, we, potentially landlord harassment, they may not have received a notice that apprises them of their rights. They do not know how to access legal assistance. Um, at that moment is where people get lost, where people fall through the cracks. Um, and systemically, we, we need to do something about that. We can't imagine that um, every landlord is uh, following the rules um, or has the same interest in maintaining housing stability for you know, the people who pay them rent every month. And I'd just like to jump, I mean, jump in and I think echo Lisa's comments, I think in particular about communications and on the ground outreach and baking that into the, how this works. I mean, cause I think what happens is, I think what happens is when people show up in the system, I mean, both from a, the data perspective and also as they kind of are aware of this at, at a point of crisis and the ability to bake in some sort of system that actually people that, you know, educates people and gets them aware of what some of the issues can be and kind of work through before it gets to that point would be creating a better system and a more equitable system and a more sane system for, I think, everyone involved. And I'll jump in too, just to say, I think some of the flexibilities that have been offered by policy solutions like the emergency rental assistance program, you know, kind of broaden our imagination of how how program social po policy programs in general can reduce barriers for applicants. Um, so things like directed tenant assistance, where financial assistance can go directly to uh, the person that needs it, or uh, you know, significantly reducing documentations that are required to prove eligibility. Uh, I think have uh, keeping those things going forward and and continuing to think through how we can reduce those barriers uh, so that those most impacted can get the assistance they need is really critical. Great, thank you. I also want to talk about about data specifically. Uh, this is the Housing Crisis Research Collaborative. Uh, I'm a former researcher myself and data geek at heart. So I think the from what I've seen that the crisis really has shown us the critical importance of data for making decision making. Um, and I think the collaborative has been particularly creative and calling new data sources or novel data sources to answer questions that the housing policy community just didn't need to answer before, or perhaps wasn't as, as timely, um, whether this is the, the census, the household pulse survey, or getting data directly from the, the rent rolls of large affordable housing providers. So just finding really creative ways to, to access data. Um, but I also think the crisis has shown how much we just don't know about the rental housing market. And Lisa, you sort of alluded to this about the, 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 the eviction process in Oregon. Um, so, you know, curious, looking forward, what are the data gaps that persist? Um, you know, what do we need to know now and what do we need to know in the long term and, and how can a sort of longer term data research agenda fill in these gaps? So maybe we can start with, with Mark and then go um, Emma and, and Lisa. Sure. I mean, again, I think as everyone knows here, and it's already come up multiple times, I think in the last you know 20 minutes or so. I mean, it's a really tough issue. I mean, when there's some data out there that can examine trends, um, you know, the eviction lab work gets cited a lot because there are numbers and they have national like 
things that they put out so you can kind of nominally look at things. Um, collection practices vary quite a lot by jurisdiction. And even then, again, we're not picking up things like unofficial but de facto evictions where tenants feel forced to move under pressure. Um, you know, Lisa mentioned the first notice doesn't actually get collected anywhere. So understanding even that level of the process doesn't really happen. Um, and that stuff isn't necessarily being picked up obviously anywhere. I mean, I think while the American Housing Survey and Household Pulse surveys are really useful in providing some overall context, they're not really able to dig into exactly what's happening on the ground. So really to get that sense of it and understand local context, you really need to get people involved at the local level to really understand a region's housing and jur you know, juridical context and be able to understand you know, what their local knowledge is to really help people understand what's actually going on. So I think that's, I think the one thing is it really has to be a lot of like act, local actors with the resources to be able to dig in and really understand the patterns and the dynamics of what's happening. So, so Mark, just a quick follow up before we go to Emma, are there any, this is a question from the, the chat, are there any um, data sources to find out how many renters are at risk of eviction at the state local level beyond the household pulse survey? I think there are, there's, um, I would actually, maybe for this particular thing, defer to uh, even Lisa and Emma on this, I think that I, there's ways you can cobble that together and there's some, there's ways to understand what's happening. I mean, I think some of the best census data, for instance, tends to be out of date um, by the time you're actually dealing with it. But there, I think there are other, there are other options out there, um, but I think it really depends on where you're at and how things are being collected and understood. I would say that as in many issues and as we try to understand the rental market, the unsubsidized rental market, um, the industry has a lot of information about how many people might be at risk for eviction because they are collecting um, data on their rent rolls, their arrearages, et cetera, whether they will um, share those uh, for a public purpose is, an, is another question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so Emma, just going back to this question about sort of longer term gaps, data, where the research community should be putting its focus, um, anything that, that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo Mark's point that I think that local and state context is so critical in this case and, and research that can focus locally is uh, really important. And I think part of that too is understanding qualitatively the renter experience during the pandemic. We do have these great data sources in the housing pulse survey uh, but it only really gives us a snapshot and kind of the experience of renters during this time uh, and there's there's so much more that i think we have to learn and so i would say you know qualitative research around renter experience and tenant experience uh you know with both rental assistance programs during the pandemic more generally and with eviction is really critical And Lisa, is there anything that you would add? I know you mentioned earlier about the kind of the, the process, the, the life cycle someone experiences going through the eviction process, um, but anything else you'd add you're thinking about in terms of data, longer term analysis? Yeah, so um, in my work here in Oregon, we've tried to um, speak to the tenant perspective, the experience of questions like, what are you spending your limited money on if not rent? And it turns out that it's basics like food. Um, and uh, the project that I have ongoing with the with the collaborative right now has a team of court observers. So we have folks who are in the in Zoom court or um, in in the courthouse to try to understand what actually happens on the ground. I think that often as policy people, we are looking at numbers and we're kind of we're thinking like policy levers without necessarily seeing how procedurally um, that actually plays out on the ground. I think that one of the things that, that I see in trying to cobble together the, the numbers that we're able to pull and those court numbers, they have to come from a local system up. They have to be state level up. I don't think there's a national data source that will, that will give us an accurate picture of counts, but it also helps us to really reframe the conversation. Um, uh, one of my sticking points is I will never use the term self-evict. I don't think that when you get an eviction notice and then you leave because you don't know what to do, that that's a self-eviction. I think you got evicted. Um, and that becomes much more clear when you um, work qualitatively with tenants and when you see what happens in court, that some of the outcomes that we see as being either acceptable or 
um, uh, on sort of the, the onus of the tenant um, are actually really structural barriers to people remaining housed. Okay, so we have about four minutes left for us. I want to do just a last round robin with any final things on your mind, looking forward, um, asking to each person to keep it to a minute or less, um, but any sort of last word that you wanted to get in. Um, so I guess we'll go maybe Emma and then Mark and, and Lisa. Sure, I think something that came up in earlier discussions too was, you know, what are long-term housing solutions uh, that can stem from what we've learned from the pandemic. And I think emergency rental assistance is a great example. As Erica cited, many, the majority of the people being served by emergency rental assistance are those extremely low income renter households at 30% of the area median income or below, and are largely households that had trouble paying their rent prior to the pandemic. And so I think, uh, you know, also thinking about research going forward, just understanding how to leverage this past the pandemic uh, and turn this into permanent policy solutions is something that I'm looking forward to. So for me, I think since we're, I mean, we're obviously in such a state of flux right now and who knows how long that will last or if it will ever end. Um, but I think it's like this weird contrast between locking and practices that we really think look to be showing some promising, promising outcomes and promising features when they are implemented during the pandemic, but also locking them in so that they're actually sustainable going forward. But I think also per, maybe paradoxically, kind of making those responses flexible enough to respond to changing pressures and challenges. I mean, I think we have a long history of the housing market in terms of redlining and subprime lending and the ownership market as well as the rental market, having policy responses that can't really necessarily respond effectively to new pressures and challenges and stressors that are actually coming. So making sure that we have a a nimble system in place to identify things as they come up, I think will be really, really crucial. Um, so I noticed uh, one of one of the comments in our in the Q and A was someone asking about my um, seeming pessimism, and I'll say one that I am. Uh, if you perceive me to be pessimistic, please know that I'm also very aware that Oregon is quite a moderate state in terms of the conditions that we're experiencing right now. We, Oregon does have a number of tenant protections and a lot of people who have really good intentions and in trying to put together um, programs and systems right now that will support tenants that don't exist in many states um, in which evictions are rolling forward at a high speed with very little moment of pause for tenants. And I, I have that on the top of my mind. And I think there were probably places I could talk about that I'd be much more pessimistic about. But this is all to say that I think in this moment, we have an opportunity, if we think about our long-term um, systems change, to, to no longer accept that non-payment evictions would happen. I think no non-payment eviction in this moment when there are billions of federal dollars, um, hundreds of millions of state dollars, uh, available um, in this moment of crisis, that there are any evictions for non-payment happening, that anyone is being set out by a sheriff is completely unconscionable. And so I think if we start our conversation from saying in um, this incredibly wealthy nation with all of the uh, very smart thinking that we're able to do, uh, that housing stability for people who rent is critical to health and well-being for everyone in our communities, um, that we could think about uh, a much more significant program um, of, of shifting both our uh, financial assistance to folks who need financial assistance and our legal system to ensure that people who happen to have the tenure of renting um, are uh, you know, sort of situated with rights um, commensurate with the importance of housing to our everyday lives. So I want to thank Lisa, Mark, Emma. Uh, thank you so much for your work, for your insights today. Um, really appreciate um, everything you're doing to, to support renters right now and to really provide these longer term insights um, for, for, for the field. So now we're going to turn it over to Merceda, I believe, to um, for a panel focused on the experience of landlords. So thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Reed, and, and what a great conversation. So thank you to those panelists. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Landlord Behavior Panel. I'm Merceda Mordazavi, Vice President on the Neighborhood Development Team at J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. Um, we have a great panel for you today to talk through landlord behavior, and I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves, and then we'll dive into the discussion. So um, Nat, Elijah, Lauren, if you could uh, unmute and um, show your video, and we'll start with you, Nat, on introductions. Hi, my name is Nat Decker. I'm a postdoctoral scholar here at the Turner Center for Housing Innovation at UC Berkeley. Elijah. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Elijah Del Campa. I'm a senior research associate with the uh, Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative and also a research affiliate with the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. And uh, my name is Lauren Lowry, Program Director for Housing and Community Development at National League of Cities. Great. Thank you all. Um, so Let's dive into the discussion, and that will actually start with you. Can you give us an overview of your research and um, the questions you wanted to answer about the prevalence of rent losses and how owners responded? Sure. So this project really came out of work that focused on the single family rental stock. Um, we did a large survey before the pandemic in 2019 um, that took a look at this part of the stock. It's about half the nation's rental units are in these um, single family rentals and they are um, predominantly owned by individuals, not corporations. So um, a lot of non-professional owners who manage their properties in a, a number of, in, a, in ways that are very different um, than you know, the typical multifamily building, especially affordable multifamily. And so we were in the middle of that project and then the pandemic um, hit and you know this changed a lot of the um, the, the things that we, you know, were studying and what we knew. And so we fielded another survey in the first quarter of this year. And one of the, one of the reasons that we did that was early on, it became apparent that the single family rental stock was, um, appeared to be getting hit harder um, for a lot of reasons than the rest of the um, rentals in the U.S. And this is largely because it had tenants who were disproportionately in um, jobs that were that disappeared or were severely cut back um, because of the pandemic. And so what we found when we surveyed the landlords the second time um, was, again, as with so much of the pandemic, uh, there was this big difference between owners who you know, were hard hit and those that weren't. Most of the owners who we surveyed um, did not report a rent revenue decline uh, relative to 2019. They were receiving as much rent or in some cases more, um, but about 35% of owners did report a decline. And in many cases, those declines were significant, you know, 10% um, or more, you know, sometimes 20%, um, even, even half, half the rent that they had received. And this is not a this was not a random thing either. There were certain owners who were much more likely um, to report rent declines, um, owners with larger portfolios, uh, owners with fewer assets, so less of a financial cushion to absorb the blow, the um, declines, they were more likely uh, to, to see a rent decline, a, a revenue decline. Uh, this also broke down on racial lines too, Black and African American owners were substantially more likely um, to see declines in rent. And so beyond that, we were also interested in how owners are dealing with these financial shocks. Um, and Elijah will talk to this a little bit more, but one of the things that, that we were, um, that we found was that many owners were, you know, seeing real financial strain because of this. You know, this is a, you know, a, a group that is, you know, higher income and has more assets certainly than tenants do. But they were really feeling a financial pressure to the extent that many of them were about 13% of the owners who we surveyed were uh, had either already sold one of their properties to cover expenses or in the process of doing that. And this is a big concern because one of the one of the headline findings from our first survey is that this is where you know a very large portion of the units that are affordable to low-income families are. Uh, this is a, a very large chunk of the nation's naturally occurring affordable housing stock. And so 
one of the big conclusions that we came out of um, this project with was that there's a real threat here um, to lose or substantially degrade um, a, a very large part of, um, of the housing stock here. And then uh, there are, you know, financial pressure also leads to, you know, increased pressure to, you know, get rid of tenants to, to evict them. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there um, because Elijah can, uh, can talk about that a little bit more. Great and, and really good transition. So Elijah, uh, moving to you, how does your work shed further light on the relationship between landlords, rent collection, and management practices during the pandemic. Yeah, thank you for, for that setup, Nat, and thank you, Mercedes. So um, yeah, I think that this is really kind of one of the main contributions of our study. Um, and, I, and I say uh, our study, this work that I did was joint with Vincent Reyna at, at UPenn and Chris Herbert, the Joint Center um, at Harvard. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's really a primary contribution, I think, because you know, much like Nat's survey, we asked landlords about rent collection and business practices both prior to and during the pandemic, right? So, so we have a nice sort of baseline with which to judge what's happening during the pandemic now. And there are really sort of three key findings that I, that I think are worth highlighting here in particular. So first, what we find is that prior to the pandemic, right, two of landlords' most common responses to rental non-payment were to charge tenants late fees for past due rent and to actually evict tenants, right? Or, or, or begin eviction proceedings against tenants. So for example, if you collected less than 90% of your yearly rent as a landlord in 2019, you were 6% more likely to charge late rent fees and actually 14% more likely to begin eviction proceedings. And in general, this is something that we, we found that landlords were, were pursuing these actions just on average pretty often, right? So they were actually two of landlords' most common responses, even among those who did not lose rental revenue in 2019. So nearly a quarter of all landlords charged late rent fees in 2019 and around 15% brought eviction proceedings against the tenant. So some baseline of sort of what's happening prior to the pandemic. This, the second finding that I think is, is worth highlighting here is that during the pandemic though, the rate at which landlords pursued these actions in general fell very sharply. Presumably in response to you know, some of the restrictions placed on these actions like local and federal eviction moratoria uh, um, that were occurring in, in this country. And, and we also find that the relationship between rental non-payment and these actions was also greatly attenuated, right? So in the case of late rent fees, actually, there's no significant relationship anymore between landlords pursuing that practice during the pandemic and collecting only a portion of their rent. So, so that relationship was just diminished. At the same time, so our final finding now, you know, during the pandemic, the thing that we're seeing is that the share of landlords pursuing other actions that were much less common prior to 2020 things like putting tenants on rental repayment plans, granting rental extensions, and deferring property maintenance, those became much more common, um, both, again, in general and conditional on rental collection. So in general, 50% of landlords in our survey uh, put tenants uh, on a rental repayment plan in 2020, and around one-third deferred maintenance at, one, at least one of their rental properties, right? And in contrast to what we're finding above, the relationship between rental non-payment and these actions increased dramatically during the pandemic, right? So putting this all together, uh, you know, I think what, what we're learning and what we saw with our work is that, you know, the local state and federal policies can, can really play a role in shaping landlord behavior, right? And, and I say this because, you know, we're talking about an environment in which landlords were constrained on their typical responses. Our survey shed light on what they like to do in a typical year, and there was great constraints on those um, during the pandemic, right? And then a couple things happened. One, they actually dropped the rate at which they did these things, um, both in general and conditional on rental payment. And two, they actually substituted to other types of actions that were relatively less common prior to the pandemic. So again, overall, I think what we're seeing here is that just proactive measures pursued by policymakers, you know, again, during the pandemic can really play a role in, in altering landlord behaviors. Great, thank you so much. And and transitioning to you, Lauren, now, I think coming from a little bit of a different seat, how do you think of this research in the context of your work um, and what have you seen over the last 18 months? 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, in the context of my work, I found each of the port reports resonated with my work. Uh, I was particularly drawn to Nathaniel's report uh, because over the last 18 months, uh, National League of Cities and the Stanford Legal Design Lab have been working with cities across the country in our eviction prevention cohort and most Currently, our eviction prevention uh, learning lab, where we support 30 cities across 22 states, and uh, we tackle or we try to address with these cities a number of issues. And one of the issues uh, where our participants are keenly focused on is landlord and tenant education, about 30%. And then almost 50% of our participants are really focused on communication and outreach and engagement. So it was not surprising to see the finding that a lot of the mom and pop landlords were lacking knowledge about uh, eviction prevention in our interventions. And due to the pandemic, uh, cities are looking for effective ways to reach and communicate with uh, this subset of landlords. Um, more so mom and pop landlords, they're not as connected to local governments as uh, landlords with larger portfolios or large multifamilies. And it was also not surprising to found in uh, both reports that the tenants that were behind in rent were black, indigenous and people of color, as well as that landlords uh, of color were disproportionately affected. Um, uh, and um, with the participants in our lab, uh, you know, a lot of them not only came to the lab to uh, work on preventing evictions, but more Importantly, they came to the lab to, to develop um, interventions with the racial equity lens. So it, it, it's really telling that these 30 cities from across 22 states are really trying to work through issues that were found throughout each of the reports. That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, Maybe starting with you, Nat, again here, um, recent research has really emphasized the unique experiences of mom and pop landlords of color. Um, but in many cases, these were the landlords that were struggling themselves and were also more likely to allow people not to pay. So what did your research show and how should this knowledge really inform strategies uh, moving forward? Sure, so one of, the, one of the things that's noteworthy about this talk is that about, <clears throat> About a quarter of um, the you know single family rental units are are owned by you know landlords of color, and you know a substantial portion of those are um, black and African American um, landlords. And again, this is not you know landlords are not randomly distributed amongst the nation's rental housing stock. They there are differences in the portfolios when you um, look at um, owners divided up by their race and ethnicity. And one of the things that's most striking there is, uh, is that um, uh, there's, a, there's a strong correlation between the, um, the race and ethnicity of the owner, the landlord, and the race and ethnicity of the tenant. And so we knew early on that the pandemic had um, caused you know, far more substantial um, income declines and um, um, among you know, African-American and Black um, tenants to begin with. One of the things that we found in our research is that that um, disparate impact uh, then sort of reverberates up into a disparate impact amongst the owners. And that's part of the reason why uh, Black and African-American owners were much more likely to see um, rent declines and much more likely to you know, have other indicators that they were feeling a much greater financial pinch and much greater financial pressure due to the pandemic. Um, and the, the, the implications for this, I think, are, are, are a number of things. I mean, I think part of, the, um, part of the argument that we've been making for a while is that, um, you know, single family rental often gets a bad name. You know, it's sort of, you know, investors competing against, you know, potential homeowners. Uh, but it also provides, a, you know, in many cases, low cost, decent quality housing in, you know, um, good neighborhoods to low and moderate income tenants and you know the relationship that tenants have with their landlord is different um, if they're an individual, particularly if they're an individual from 
the neighborhood than it is um, if you're interacting with you know a corporate landlord you know who has an agent um, you know implementing policies set at a um, set at a different level and so the I think there's an argument to think about the preservation of this stock and to think about you know having you know, rental assistance be a part of that and have the landlord be included in those calculations and be a way that you can drive um, participation in these programs because landlords who I talked to during this process um, did that. So I'll, 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 I'll pause there um, um, because I'm sure that uh, Lauren and Elijah have, have things to say on this topic as well. Yeah, Elijah or Lauren, anything else to add here on mom and pop landlords of color? Uh, yeah, I can jump in quickly. So I, I think that um, those are all obviously great, great points Matt, Matt raises. And I think I would add just, uh, you know, keeping in mind actually the, the tenants as well and, and making affirmative commitment to vulnerable tenants as well as vulnerable landlords, um, because I, I think that just a, a critical finding in, in my study as well, actually, was that landlords' responses to the pandemic were actually in and of themselves quite racialized too, even after you control for the fact that renters and communities of color, um, you know, were, were unable to pay as much during the pandemic. So basically, in addition to asking um, questions about landlords' portfolios, we also asked questions about individual properties in their portfolios, which actually enabled us to, you know, tie those properties back to um, their census block group. And then you could look at a whole array of demographic characteristics, right? So things like whether or not a property is located in a community with a majority of residents of color. So, uh, you know, what we did then, what we found is that landlords were actually much more likely, again, conditional on rental payment, to pursue punitive actions against tenants in, in properties of color. And they were much less likely to offer concessions. So evictions were more likely, uh, late fees for, for past due rent were more likely, rental forgiveness was much less likely. So. Um, basically, I just want to make sure that, you know, while there's clearly a, a, a need for solutions, um, policy solutions that support owners, and particularly small owners of color, I think that, you know, we, there's also this need for an affirmative commitment to tenants housed by, by those landlords as well. Um, and, you know, taking proactive steps to, to address these disproportionate measures, you know, that have occurred during the pandemic in the past, and, and, and you know, maybe will be continuing into the future. So just wanted to raise that too, I think. And uh, to add to the conversation, I think um, each report, I think, urges cities to do two things. I think the first is to always be intentional about embedding a racial equity lens in eviction prevention intervention, as well as facilitating inclusive community engagement strategies. And not just for the work we do with tenants, but also the work that needs to be done with galvanizing and working with mom and pop landlords. Also, I think there needs to be an emphasis of when engagement with landlords begin. Um, it needs to begin early and often, as well as throughout each stage of the uh, eviction process. That means pre, during, and post. Um, also, I think uh, each of the reports uh, is urging cities to think strategically about preserving affordable housing. As both reports have uh, reported, you know, landlords were spent, uh, reported a loss of revenue and a lot of landlords had to pivot in terms of cutting back on things such as maintenance or selling their property. Uh, surprisingly enough, in the eviction prevention cohort, we talk about a range of topics, but one of the topics that we also focus on is housing affordability and stability, and that needs to be at the center of the conversation as well, so we can preserve and uh, build additional affordable housing to ensure that uh, tenants are safely and affordably housed. So just doubling down on the comment uh, Nathaniel made earlier about the preservation of affordable housing stock. That's great, Lauren. Kind of building off of that a little bit, the you know the pandemic caused a lot of outreach directly to landlords, both uh, for assistance and data gathering purposes, including the two surveys we're talking about uh, now that were conducted the Reist Collaborative. How much of that outreach is new? What are we learning from it? How should continue beyond the pandemic. 
Yeah, a lot of this outreach is new, you know. Um, evictions were talked about prior to the pandemic, but cities doubling down on um, outreach as it relates to landlords is really new. And um, it's it was brought on by the pandemic. Um, the outreach was also has been able to augment with the federal resources that have been made available. Um, and the federal resources that have been made available. And um, what this tells us, and something we talk often about in the learning lab, as well as in the cohort, is that uh, outreach needs to continue after, uh, after we're done with this pandemic. One, so we can facilitate those relationships. And, and so that we don't go scrambling, looking for landlords during the pandemic when we're trying to address the issue and that we're building the trust. We're also working with these landlords to um, program design as well, in addition to tenants, so that we're really able to distribute funding or have the services uh, needed. Um, also, I, I would say as it relates to outreach to landlords and data processing, that needs to continue. Um, the more information we know about landlords, the, the better off we are in building out programs and resources. As well, I, I can't stress enough as to with this data, we can safely house uh, tenants safely and affordably because we're building uh, programs and resources that, uh, that can help landlords sustain their, um, their property. Anything that would want to respond to what or amend or add? Um, I think, I mean, I think that in, you know, uh, this is part of the thing, a lot of our work, even though it was done for the most part separately, really aligns. Um, so, I mean, I'm not sure that I have much to say beyond, you know, just agreeing wholeheartedly um, with, uh, with Lauren here. I will quickly use this as an opportunity to plug rental registries um, because, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, not going scrambling, looking for landlords in the future and just this need to collect this information on, on landlords and have it for, you know, the next pandemic, the next crisis. So, I mean, just rental registries, uh, you know, were, were basically the way that we contacted landlords in eight out of the 10 cities that participated in our study, right? And, and essentially, registries do a lot of different things. Um, most registries I've encountered encompass up-to-date contact information for landlords. And you can use this to sort of ensure, you know, quality, uh, quality of life uh, standards for, for rental housing. I think that there's also, you know, new novel ways that you can think about these registries moving forward into the future. So I think our study is, is really sort of, you know, that's one use case. You can actually survey landlords and, 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 you know, try to collect information on landlords and tenants in real time. If you take it one step further, I think you can think, well, what if those registries actually collected this information already? What if this was the norm? What if rent rolls and uh, monthly, monthly rental collection and, and monthly evictions were something that we actually wanted to track and maintain as a city. You know, I think sort of just the use case for these things has, has really been sort of um, driven home for registries rather, has really been driven home during the pandemic. And, you know, of course it just goes without saying. The other thing is like, you know, maybe it's good to know how to reach landlords in the case where, you know, you need to get them something like rental assistance dollars or want to make sure people are playing by the rules for things like eviction moratoria. So I think that um, th I just wanted to take it as an opportunity to plug registries as another really great low hanging fruit type thing to, to really sort of, um, you know, track information on landlords and be able to reach them in times of crisis. If I can just add a little bit of cross panel connection here. Um, Professor Bates was describing earlier the the um, the disconnect um, that a lot of low income um, and moderate income tenants have with the kinds of apparatuses in both in terms of policy and programs that we have 
um, at you know local level all the way up to the federal level to deal with housing problems. You know, most a lot of people just don't know about um, these things and have never heard of them, and you know have no idea you know if they're eligible or that these things are um, available. The same is true with um, with many landlords, um, particularly when you're talking about the single family, the owners of single family rentals. I mean, I, you know, I talked with owners who were, you know, who had already sold some of their properties to cover expenses. I asked them if they had, you know, participated in emergency rental system programs. They had no idea what I was talking about. And these were programs that were already up and running. Um, so the, you know, there, there is an enormous room for improvement. And this is an enormous opportunity to establish an infrastructure here that you know that can be built upon and utilized the, the next time there is a housing crisis or even you know as again to um to kind of bring up a point of professor bates's earlier deal with the problems that are there and are are catastrophic in normal times you know the enormous levels of eviction and the chronic affordability problems that we have when you talk to um, to landlords, you quickly you know understand that the only of option that is available um, and provided by the public sector in cases of rent non-payment is almost always just eviction. That's the only tool that you are provided with by the government. Now there's another tool. There's emergency rental assistance. You know, I think that having that sort of frame and that sort of way of looking at it shows the potential that this sort of moment has um, to provide a different way of dealing with the chronic problem of renters' incomes not matching their expenses routinely over the course of a year. Pause again. And if I can add one thing when it comes to outreach, it's how to normalize it uh, in terms of working with the courts, uh, working with different um, venues to getting information out there to landlords, both uh, traditional means and tactile means of outreach to landlords um, uh, has been some of the discussions we've been having in the eviction prevention learning lab and really thinking through uh, the communication um, resources that are made available and what gaps are there and how to really triage uh, the type of content that is easy to understand the information or the types of programming. Sometimes it's the way we word things that can be overwhelming or that there's not a clear and direct way to get assistance, even as easy as prior to the pandemic, a lot of cities did not have websites uh, about uh, eviction related programming for either landlords or rent, uh, renters. And, and now you see a, a plethora of programs out there that landlords can easy access information is also as easy as how is the information getting disseminated if you're using social media what is your ground approach to distributing information as well so just really thinking through how you do a uh, communication and outreach with your um, landlords We may have lost Mercedes. Um, so it's actually not terrible timing because we only have about five minutes left of this panel. So if you all wanted to go around and do just some last minute remarks, we'll um, close out with our closing remarks afterwards. Cool, yeah, I, I can start there. I, I think that I just wanted to um, sort of just bring us back to something we've been talking about a lot in this panel and that's just affordability, right? I mean. A, a major finding of, of mine and Matt's work, in fact, a nearly identical finding across the two surveys, which is, which is very uh, you know, interesting, <laughs> is that landlords are, are looking to shed their properties. They are listing their properties for sale at an increased rate, up from 3% in 2019 to around 13% in 2020. And you know, 
it's important to again keep in mind that the majority of the respondents to both mine and Nat's work work small landlords, exactly those landlords who provide the bulk of our nation's naturally occurring affordable units. And you know, we are scared and nervous about any one of those units selling because this is a market in which there was already a, so much stress prior to the pandemic, already vastly greater demand than supply. So when one of these units, you know, from my perspective, sells, that has serious implications for housing affordability um, into the future and, and puts additional strain, again, on the system that is already under a lot of stress. So just keeping in mind affordability, to me, that is, that is really the headline sort of result from, from all of our efforts here, that is something we really need to keep an eye on as we, you know, move out of the pandemic and move into the future. And uh, I guess I will close out just the emphasis that uh, as we are doing outreach with the tenants, it's also important that we're doing outreach and education with landlords, um, making sure that they understand um, what resources are available, what are their rights and responsibility, as, as well as seeing them as partners in program design. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave it there. Uh, my my plus one on all of this um, will just be to um, to note our one of our pieces from the first um, survey that we did took a look specifically at how these landlords set their rents and asked the question of are rents low here because you know these are you know um, older, you know, poor quality properties in kind of lower end neighborhoods, you know, we know that's true to a certain extent, or are they low, at least in part, because owners are knowingly setting their rent below market for various reasons. And we found that about it's, you know, while the latter is true, about half of owners are setting their rent below market, knowingly so, and measurably so, too. So this, you know, this is an important part of the stock um, for a lot of reasons affordability is one of the is one of the big ones so I'll, I'll i'll close with that thank you all um so i'm ingrid ellen from the one of the faculty directors at the Furman center and uh, i am on the faculty of the, the wagner school at nyu and i'm one of the, the the members of the the researchers in the in the collaborative um, really honored to be part of this. Um, I just I hope you learned as much as I did from from these panels today and these discussions. These are exactly the kind of dialogues between practitioners and researchers that that we really are trying to foster through the collaborative. And and I and I think that these also these panels showed a, a sample of the kind of timely research and data analysis that that um, we're trying to support through through the collaborative to conduct and to support that um, can help policymakers design and implement and evaluate more effective rental housing responses to the to the pandemic. Um, and I, you know, in addition, and I think you sort of saw through these discussions, uh, another goal of the collaborative is also to lift up lessons um, that have been that are that we've learned during this during this period of crisis that can help to to um, improve ongoing kind of you know more conventional rental housing programs during um, more normal times or more normal times of our regular rental housing um, affordability crisis. Um, and, and I think finally, um, you know, I, I think that this, this last example that um, uh, Elijah and Nat brought up about the sort of the role that, you know, that they've sort of, it shows sort of how their, their survey work, their really, really unique um, uh, survey work has, um, you know, potentially sort of identified an early, given us sort of an early warning of of something that's gonna that's that's happening in the um, potentially happening in the small rental housing stock um, in terms of the sort of increased interest in in sales and that's something certainly that not, I think um, we want to be we want to be tracking going forward. So um, I also just um, you know want to um, say that the there is going to be um, a recording that I think it it um, uh, you know 
uh, that um, I think will be, uh, I think, in, I think it's now in the in the uh, Q and A what, where the link is. But this discussion will be; it has been recorded. It will be posted, um, and so you know, please feel free to share it with others. If uh, the link with others, if you feel like it would be, it would be useful. And then most of all, really, my job is just to say thank you, thank you so much to to all of our panelists, our fantastic panelists and speakers, and. Um, thank you to the, the production team at the Urban Institute for, for putting this together so seamlessly. Um, and uh, thank you to our funders, to, to JP Morgan Chase and to the Wells um, Fargo Foundation for the generous support of the, of the research and the work that we do through the, um, through the collaborative. Um, and finally, thank you to, to all of the audience for, um, I, you know, I've been sort of listening and trying to kind of monitor the Q&A, but, but great questions. Um, and um, feel free to email after, you know, us afterwards with additional questions. So thank you very much. And, um, you know, we'll see you at our next event.